is uh, Azef Rosengarten from uh, the University of Jerusalem, and he'll speak on uh, rigidity for unirational groups. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's nice to speak here. Uh, hopefully next time in person, actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so I'm talking about rigidity for unirational groups. Uh, okay. So one of the foundational results in the theory of abelian varieties is uh, a rigidity theorem, which says that if you have two abelian varieties over some field and you have a morphism of K schemes, so a priori nothing to do with the group structure, uh, and it maps the identity to the identity, then in fact, it's automatically a K group homomorphism. Okay, so it automatically prefer, preserves the uh, K group structure. And this has many consequences, uh, commutativity, for example, of abelian varieties by applying this to the identity morphism, uh, uniqueness of group structures with the given identity point by applying this to the identity map. Uh, it implies that, for example, you can construct polarizations by just constructing maps that preserve identity. So it, it gives you a lot of uh, important, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it has many important uh, applications in the theory of abelian varieties. Okay, so the proof of this rigidity result here for abelian varieties uh, makes essential use of the fact that abelian varieties are proper. And you know, it typically fails for affine group schemes. So you know, for example, if you take any polynomial uh, in K join X with uh, F of with zero constant term, then that gives you a morphism of GA, an endomorphism which preserves identities. But you know, usually such a polynomial is not going to be a homomorphism, right? So if you take F of X as X to the sixth, that's not a homomorphism of, from GA to itself over any field. Okay, so now let me give. Uh, some motivation for studying these unirational groups. So let me just move this here. Uh, so over a perfect field, every smooth connected unipotent group admits a filtration with successive quotients isomorphic to GA. Okay, so you have this sequence of groups, each one normal in X, and the quotients are all GA. Okay, so we call such a unipotent group split, split unipotent. Uh, so what this says, over a perfect field, every smooth connected unipotent group is split, uh, but over imperfect, fields, this is totally false. So here's a simple example. You <clears throat> start with an imperfect field K and A is a non pth power. And you consider the group V defined by the equation Y to the P is X plus A X to the P inside of GA square. Right, that's a subgroup because you're in characteristic P. Uh, it becomes isomorphic to GA over the extension K adjoint A to the one over P via the map, which sends X Y to Y minus A to the one over P X, right? You know, so this equation implies that X will be the pth power of this expression. So that allows you to recover X if you know this expression and it allows you to recover Y then by solving for Y. Uh, so <clears throat> this gives you an, isomorph an isomorphism to GA over this purely inseparable extension, but V is not isomorphic to GA over K because, well, I mean, one way to see it is that if you take the regular compactification of this curve, so you take this equation, the projectivization, it's regular, so it's the regular compactification, then the point at infinity, which is the point with z equals zero, is not a k-rational point, right? It becomes rational over k joint a to the one over p. And if this were isomorphic to GA, then the point at infinity, that would be, the compactification would be p1. The point at infinity is the point at infinity. It's a rational point. And so this can't be isomorphic to GA even as a scheme. OK. <clears throat> so the group V is an example of a so-called wound unipotent group. Uh, so we say that a smooth connected unipotent group is wound if it admits no non-trivial K homomorphisms from the group GA, the additive group. And uh, this is equivalent to requiring that all K morphisms from the affine line to U be constant. It's not obvious. I mean, clearly, if there are no non-constant morphisms from the affine line, then it doesn't contain a copy of GA. But, you know, the reverse is not clear. But in fact, they're equivalent. Okay, so now here's a very nice theorem of Osterle from 1984, his paper on Tamagawa numbers. Um, let K be a global function field and let U be a wound unipotent K group of dimensions strictly less than P minus one, where P is the characteristic. Then U has only finitely many rational points. Okay, and he proves this by some manipulations with equations. Um, you know, you can give, basically you can reduce the case where U is given by some, by some equation, some sort of equation inside of GA to some power. And then he just sort of does some manipulations with equations. Um, but my point here is the dimension bound is sharp. Okay, that's, that's the first observation. And in fact, if you see why it's sharp, it leads you to a natural question. So 
if you take the group U, which is you take the Weyer restriction of GM from K to the one over P down to K. So K to the one over P is a degree P extension for any global function field. And you quotient by the copy of GM living inside, right? There's just like K cross lives in K to the one over P cross. That in fact is an inclusion of algebraic groups and you form the quotient. That quotient is, has, so the Weyer restriction of GM has dimension P because it's a degree P extension. And when you quotient by GM, you get dimension P minus one. So this is a P minus one dimensional group and it's in fact wound unipotent. Uh, but it doesn't have finitely many rational points because this Weyer restriction of GM is an open subscheme of affine space to the degree of k to the one over p over k, so affine p space. Uh, and so it follows that this group, which is a quotient of this open subscheme, is in fact unirational. And any unirational scheme over infinite field has a risky dense set of rational points, in particular has lots and lots of rational points. Uh, so this naturally led to a question uh, which Osterle asked, and uh, I think he attributes to Serre, which is, if you have a global function field and you have a unipotent group over it with infinitely many rational points, can this only happen in sort of the obvious way that U contains a non-trivial unirational K subgroup? Okay. Should that be GA or is that really GM? Uh, sorry, is what GA? In your definition of U. Oh, oh no, no, it's GM, it's GM. No, if you took GA, you'd get a split group. This is G. Yeah, it's weird because you know you're sort of used to thinking, well, this is GM is totally not unipotent. But if you take a Weyer restriction through a purely inseparable extension, and then quotient by the copy of GM living inside, that's actually uh, unipotent. So one way to see this, for example, is uh, so so think just at the level of let's say k rational points. Um, you have k to the one over p cross mod k cross. That is a p torsion group. Because if you take any element k to the one over p cross and you raise it to the p, you will live in k cross. And then in fact, this group is a p torsion group. And so in particular, a smooth connected p torsion group has to be unipotent. So it's, it's actually a unipotent group, even though it's built out of this weird GM, you know, in this weird way from GM. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So Here's some examples of unirational groups, um, just to sort of let you know that they, these things actually exist. Um, any connected linear algebraic group over a perfect field is unirational. Um, so over perfect fields, everything, well, linear algebraic and connected is unirational. Uh, tori are always unirational over any field. Perfect groups, so if G equals its derived group, it's unirational. Uh, one way to see that is it's, it's such groups are always generated by their K tori. Reductive groups are unirational. Uh, again, they're always generated by their K tori. Um, if you take a Weyer restriction of GM from a finite K algebra, that's also unirational. Again, because it's an open subscheme of an affine space. Uh, and then this example, this last example is in the spirit of this group U constructed in the previous slide. If you take any finite purely inseparable extension, K prime over K, if you take the Weyer restriction of GM and quotient by the GM living naturally inside of it, that's a wound unipotent group and it's unirational because it's a quotient of this open subscheme of an affine space. Okay. So now here's the main result, or at least let's say provisionally, I'll call this the main result. Um, well, I'll make a comment about it after I state it. So let G and H be finite type group schemes over a field of degree of imperfection one. So that means that K to the one over P is a degree P extension of K. Um, that's what degree of imperfection one means. So assume that G is unirational and that H is solvable and does not contain a copy of GA. So it doesn't contain a K subgroup, subgroup scheme, K isomorphic to GA. Then any K scheme morphism from G to H preserving identities is actually a K group scheme homomorphism. Okay. Um, so it's it's the similar it's it's basically the same result for as for abelian varieties in the case that you have morphisms from a unirational thing to a solvable thing not containing GA, and in particular you know a special case which is actually the sort of key case is when H is wound unipotent, because that's you know unipotent groups are, are solvable and it wounds exactly says that it doesn't contain a copy of GA. So I should say there are, so this I'll call the main result, but I will discuss toward the end. Hopefully I'll have time. Uh, there are rigidity results over arbitrary fields. So you can, it's not like you can't say anything uh, over fields of higher degree of imperfection. There are very important things you can say, which I hope to discuss at the end, sort of work in progress. I mean, I, I know how to do it, but I haven't written it out carefully, but uh, um, okay. 
But this result, as stated, requires degree of imperfection one. I'll give some examples later to show that you really need that assumption. Okay, so some corollaries. So uh, if you have a field of degree of imperfection one, then you know any solvable unirational group not containing GA is commutative. Um, so in particular, any unirational wound unipotent group is commutative. And again, just like with abelian varieties, you apply rigidity to the inversion map. Inversion is a homomorphism that exactly says the group is commutative. Uh, and then the second corollary is, again, the uniqueness of group structures. So if you have a field degree of imperfection one, solvable unirational not containing GA, uh, then there's only one group structure with a given ident with the, the same identity point. Again, you apply rigidity to if you have two group structures, you apply rigidity to the identity map. It says the identity is a homomorphism, which exactly says the group structures agree. Okay. So these corollaries are false over every field of degree of imperfection greater than one. So if you omit this degree of imperfection one assumption, the assertions are false. Both of these I'll give examples later. Okay. Um, so another important consequence of rigidity is the following proposition. So let G be a finite type K group scheme. K is degree of imperfection one. And let uh, big K be a, over little K, be a separable extension, which we don't assume to be algebraic. It could be like little K adjoin X, for example. Uh, then G is unirational over little K, if and only if it is unirational over big K. Okay. So when G is commutative, this is a theorem of a ket without the degree of imperfection one assumption. Um, but here it's true in general. And I should say again, the degree in this case, so for these corollaries, you need a degree of imperfection one. For this, you don't. And I'll discuss this at the end, how this follows from a more general rigidity result. Um, the degree of imperfection one assumption is unnecessary. This proposition holds over any field whatsoever. Okay, so let me sketch the proof. Of this proposition, which which really on some level boils down to you know how do you deduce the general case from the unipotent case? So it's sort of applicable in general in a sense. Um, so the first lemma: if G is a smooth connected K-group scheme, then it's generated by the centralizers of its maximal tori. Um, and well, actually, something stronger is true. But so by a theorem of Conrad, Gabra, and Prasad, the subgroup generated by the maximal tori is normal with unipotent quotient U. So if you just take the tori rather than their centralizers, you get a normal subgroup with unipotent quotient. And so it suffices to show that the subgroup generated by the centralizers of maximal tori surjects onto this unipotent quotient U. But in fact, for any maximal torus T, uh, the map from the centralizer of T to U is surjective. Uh, why? Well, because in general, surjective morphisms of smooth connected groups induce surjections on centralizers of maximal tori. So that tells you the centralizer of T surjects into the centralizer in U of the image of T, which because U is unipotent is just one. And the centralizer of one, of course, is all of U. So this actually shows that in fact, uh, the, the tori, not their centralizers, just the tori together with the centralizer of any single maximal torus generates G. You don't need all the centralizers. Okay. Um, so here's the next lemma. If G is smooth and connected and T is a split torus of G, uh, if G is unirational, then so is the centralizer of T. And so the proof is you have this open cell decomposition associated to a co-character of G. So if you have a co-character of G with the same centralizer as T, which most co-characters will have that property, um, then you get, so you have these groups, these, these sort of, uh, I don't know, generalized root groups, or I don't know what you would call them, but you have these U minus, U plus, and the centralizer of T, and you have the multiplication map from this, these subgroups. So this times this times this goes to G via multiplication. This map is an open immersion, and, and actually it doesn't matter for purposes of this argument, but these are actually split unipotent groups, these U plus and U minus. And so, you know, if G is unirational, and so is this open subscheme, and therefore so is this factor ZG of T. Okay. Now, given a short exact sequence, so this is the third lemma for proving this uh, descent through separable extensions of unirationality. Given a short exact sequence of groups with U uh, unipotent and T a torus, if G is unirational over big K, big K being the separable extension, then it's unirational over little k. So the, the idea of the proof, I won't give all the details, but the key case is when U is wound unipotent. And since U is unirational over big K, the rigidity theorem, so again, this is degree of imperfection one, I should say here. Uh, the rigidity theorem implies that U uh, b over big K and therefore U itself over little k is commutative. The rigidity theorem says that unirational wound unipotent groups are commutative. So it follows that G is commutative 
you know, an extension of a commutative group by a torus is always commutative. So G is commutative. And then by a theorem of Aket, using geometric class field theory, unirationality descends from separable extensions for commutative groups. And so we're done. This group is commutative. So that's it. We're done in the case that U is wound unipotent. OK, so now let's prove this proposition that unirationality descends from separable extensions when the degree of imperfection is 1. So we can, we're free to enlarge, replace big K with an even larger uh, separable extension. So we can assume it's separably closed. And so that implies that the, if you take a maximal torus, it's split because you're over a separably closed field. And since it's split, um, the centralizer of T over big K is unirational for any torus, right? That was this lemma, whatever it is. If G is unirational, then the centralizer of a split torus is also unirational. So this is unirational. And then this lemma on the previous page says, so the centralizer of T, if you quotient by T is unipotent because T was a maximal torus. So that tells you that ZG of T is actually unirational over a little k for any maximal torus. And then finally, G is generated by the centralizers of its maximal tori. In other words, there's a surjection of K schemes, not of K group schemes, but of K schemes from some finite product of centralizers of, of maximal tori to G. And each of these is unirational over little k and therefore so too is G, okay? So now let me discuss the proof of this rigidity uh, result. Um, so where do you use uh, uh, this assumption that the degree of imperfection is one? Ah, so you use it over here in order to include the G is, so, okay. U is wound unipotent, U sub big K is unirational, right? And then the rigidity theorem implies that U sub big K is commutative. And so, that, then we get from that, the G, right? Because part a corollary of rigidity was that wound unirational groups are commutative over fields of degree of imperfection one. And so we get that U is commutative and therefore G is commutative. And then by theorem of Aket, unirationality descends from separable extensions for commutative groups. Okay, and so G is commutative. And so since it's unirational over the separable extension, it's unirational over little k. But the key point was deducing the commutativity of U. And somehow this reduction to the commutative case will also be the key in general over arbitrary fields, but, but we can't deduce it from this rigidity result. Uh, in general, over fields of degree of imperfection bigger than one, in fact, over any field of degree of imperfection bigger than one, you can construct unirational uh, wound unipotent groups that are not commutative. So I'll give an example uh, later over any field of higher degree of imperfection. Nevertheless, you can still prove this proposition uh, that unirationality descends through separable extensions via slightly more uh, involved argument. Well, not a slightly different argument. Uh, okay. So let me outline the proof of the rigidity theorem. Uh, and actually, you know, the thing about this proof, so this rigidity theorem will really be subs uh, subsumed in a more general result, which I'll discuss at the end, actually, partially. But um, more interesting to me than, than the rigidity itself here, because of the fact that it's subsumed in this, in this more general rigidity result, more interesting than that is a result we'll come to in the proof, which gives a sort of structural theorem for unirational groups, uh, unipotent unirational groups over degree, fields of degree of imperfection one. So I'll come to that later. But uh, so let me discuss the proof of the rigidity theorem. So we can assume that K is separably closed. Um, and the key case is when G is commute. So we have this map from G to H, which we want to be a homomorphism, right? Uh, so the key case is when G is commutative and H is a equals U is commutative P torsion wound unipotent group. So we begin with a study of commutative unirational groups. Okay, so here's a definition. Let X bar be a regular proper curve and let D uh, inside, this should say X bar, uh, be a finite subscheme. Then the generalized Jacobian of the pair X bar D is the group scheme representing the functor consisting of pairs uh, L phi, where L is a degree zero line bundle on X bar, and phi is a trivialization of L along D. Okay, so it's basically the Jacobian with some extra, a little extra data. And so the canonical map from the generalized Jacobian to the Jacobian, which just forgets this trivialization, is surjective, and its kernel is a uh, very restriction of GM from D quotient by the copy of GM living inside. So it lives in an exact sequence like this, this generalized Jacobian. Okay, so uh, just as for the usual Jacobians of curves, right? So, so in general, right, if you have, let's say a smooth proper curve and you have its Jacobian, right? You get a map and you choose any point of the curve, you get a map from the curve into the Jacobian using that point. 
right, as the base point, so to speak. So we have similarly here for any point in the smooth locus of X bar minus this uh, divisor D, uh, you get a map from, uh, depend you get this map depending on X from the smooth locus minus D to the generalized Jacobian. And then there's this important result from geometric class field theory, which says that this basically has an Alban AC type property for maps into commutative groups. So it says if I have a smooth curve with regular compactification X bar, and I take D to be the complement of X inside of X bars, which is the boundary, then given a commutative K group scheme G and a morphism of pointed schemes, so from big X to G, we're sending little x to zero, then there's a divisor with the same support as D. So maybe it has some extra nilpotent structure or something. And a unique K group homomorphism from the generalized Jacobian of D prime with respect to D prime to G, such that this diagram commutes. So a map from X to G factors uniquely through a generalized Jacobian with support whose divisor has the same support as, as the complement of X in its compactification. Uh, okay. So now we apply this when, well, okay, start with the case with, we, we apply this when G is a commutative unirational group. So that means the fact that G is unirational says it's generated by maps uh, of the form X to G, where X is an open subscheme of the projective line. And the Jacobian of the projective line is zero. And so if you take a generalized Jacobian of the projective line with respect to some divisor, then all you get is some Bay restriction of GM mod GM. Okay, so the preceding theorem says if X is, so G is generated by maps from X and therefore by maps from these generalized Jacobians of P1. And so uh, G is generated by homomorphisms from groups of the form Bay restriction of GM from a finite K algebra. So there's, so, you know, we get this corollary, a commutative unirational group admits a surjective K homomorphism uh, from very restriction of GM for some finite K algebra A. And so in proving that the map from G to H is a homomorphism, we can replace G with this thing which surjects onto it. And so uh, we can assume G is a very restriction of GM from a finite K algebra. And in fact, using the fact that U is wound, we can easily reduce the case in which A is just a product of fields. So we can assume that G is some product of very restrictions from finite field extensions. With K. Okay, so now in order to show that a K scheme morphism from G to U preserving identities is a homomorphism, uh, we may replace U by the subgroup generated by the image of the map F. Okay, and so in particular, since G is unirational, we can assume that U is unirational. The subgroup generated by F will be unirational because G is. So we can assume U is unirational, and so we're led to analyze unirational wound unipotent groups. And so in order to do this, we define two important groups, uh, which will play a role in the proof. Uh, so let lambda be any non pth power of K. And K here actually could be any field, although our interest is when it's degree of imperfection one. But so lambda is a non pth power, and we define these two groups. So the first is V lambda, which is just the group defined by this equation. The sum from zero to P minus one of lambda I X I to the P is zero inside GA to the P, right? So these XIs are some variables you have, this is a P minus one dimensional group and it has no non-zero points even over the separable closure of K because lambda is not a P power. So this is a totally non-smooth group. Uh, the other group U1 lambda will be a wound unipotent group of dimension P minus one. It's basically the group we defined earlier to show that Osterle's bound, dimension bound was sharp. You take the very restriction of GM from K adjoint lambda to the one over P down to K and then you quotient by the copy of GM living inside. And in fact, when K is degree of imperfection one, which is our situation here, uh, both of these groups are independent of lambda because this extension is just K to the one over P and this you can make a change of variables basically. Um, okay, so we have these two groups though, that's the point. So now here's the key result, which actually is the sort of more interesting, in some sense, this is the most interesting aspect of this, the proof for degree of imperfection one, I would say is uh, let you, okay, so it's a structure theorem for unirational groups in degree of imperfection one. So let U be a non-trivial unirational wound unipotent K group where K is a separably closed field of degree of imperfection one. So it's important that it be separably closed. Um, then there's an exact sequence like so. So in other words, if you have a non-trivial unirational wound unipotent group, then it contains a subgroup which is isomorphic to either V lambda or U1 lambda where the quotient is wound. Okay, so it's an extension of a wound necessarily unirational group because it's a quotient of a unirational group by one of these. So as you can imagine, this sort of result allows you to prove all sorts of, you know, 
facts, if you want to prove something about a wound unirational group, you basically, this result often allows you to reduce it to the case of one of these two groups, these two explicit groups. And that, that is why this is useful, at least, uh, well, yes, that's why that's useful. So I'm going to also add a remark here that this Devi Sanj proposition uh, may be used to show that extensions of unirational unipotent groups. So if I have a group and it lives in an exact sequence where the two ends are both unirational, then you can ask, does it follow the group itself as unirational? This is a question that uh, Aket asked in some, uh, a paper of his, for I think he asked it for commutative groups. But at any rate, uh, you can use this proposition to actually show that this is true. So extensions of unirational unipotent groups are still unirational over fields of degree of imperfection one. Uh, and this is actually false in degree of imperfection greater than one. So over any field of degree of, degree of imperfection greater than one, you can construct extensions of unirational groups that are not unirational, even commutative extensions, commutative p-torsion extensions, yeah. Okay, and one more remark I'll actually also make about this debye sash proposition is that even though it applies to degree of imperfection one, right, it's fields of degree of imperfection one, it actually is useful uh, it's important in the sort of general theory of unirational groups, even over fields of higher degree of imperfection for reasons having to do with spreading out and specializing arguments often allow you to proceed by induction on the degree of imperfection. And, and there are various things you might wanna prove. Like for example, you might wanna say that a unirational wound unipotent group has dimension divisible by P minus one. And one, so this one way to prove this is by a sort of spreading out argument reducing to degree of imperfection one, and then using the steffi sage proposition. But okay. So this is the result. U contains one of these two groups with wound quotient. Okay, so then I have some discussion here about how it completes the proof of rigidity, which I think I may skip. Um, there's some, as you can imagine, right, you can do it then by just somehow reducing to the case of these two groups in some way. Okay, so I will skip this. Okay. <clears throat> So maybe I'll talk a bit about the proof of this Devisage proposition. So the statement is, let U be a non-trivial unirational wound unit a group, then there's an extension, blah, blah, there's an exact sequence like this. Okay, great. So how do you prove this? Okay. Is so, there any kind of uniqueness in the oh, decomposition? Uh, not that I can think of. No, I mean, well, what would you have in mind? Like, is there a unique subgroup isomorphic to it? Or, I mean, I don't or, know. There really is, or at least the no, the number of of these. Oh, the number of things that are isomorphic to each piece of the same type would be would be uh, invariant or something like that. Uh, if if you go all the way and break it down. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying if you go all the way and you say how many v lambdas and how many u one lambdas, basically that's what you're saying. And will you're saying will it always be the same number? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes, but I would have to think about it. I think it would be always the same number. Um, uh, in fact, I think the argument about to give probably sort of allows you to show that, um, but one has to be careful, but okay. So, um, right, so we have to show that U contains either V lambda or U1 lambda, so that's the first step. So we consider these groups, UN lambda, which is the Ve restriction of GM from K joint lambda one over P to the N, quotient by the value restriction from K adjoint lambda one over P to the N minus one. Okay. And U1 lambda is, is of course, this is consistent with the previous notation. And when N is one, you get the recover the group U1 lambda. So now, first of all, um, the fact that U is unirational means it admits a homomorphism from a Ve restriction of GM from some finite field extension. This was this discussion earlier. And since K is separably closed, right? That's part of the assumptions. It follows that any extension is of this form, right? any finite extension of K is of this form. And so it admits a map from some Vey restriction of GM from K adjoint lambda one over P to the N. And since U is P torsion commutative, so, so okay, this subgroup it turns out is the is P times this group. The image of multiplication by P on this group is this subgroup. Sorry, Zev, why, wait, could you go back? Why is there a map from one of these for some N? Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that right now, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the reason there's such a map is there's a map from one of these groups on top in the numerator because, so here, uh, so here, uh, a unirational oh, right, group right. has a map from a Ve restriction. And any, and you can, and because it's wound, it's a Ve, you can, there's a map from a Ve restriction of a field, 
a finite field extension. And because K is separably closed, any finite field extension is of this form for some n. And you know, it's, it's separately closed of degree of imperfection one. And so, um, yeah, so there's a map from one of these groups and the image multiplication by P on this group is this subgroup, it turns out. And so because U is P torsion, there's gonna to be a map from some UN lambda, a non-zero map. Okay, so now if there's a map from U1 lambda, then we have a map from U1 lambda. Okay, great. Uh, but if not, what do we do? Well, let N be the minimal positive integer such that there's a non-zero homomorphism from UN lambda to U. So it turns out that there's an exact sequence for N greater than one from UN lambda to UN minus one lambda. So, so this map here is basically multiplication by P. It's a multiplication by P map. Uh, but the point is it's surjective and its kernel is a power of V lambda. The one of the, you know, this totally non-smooth group defined here by this equation. Okay, so you have an exact team like this. So now, uh, if N is, so this is for N greater than one. So if N is greater than one, the minimality of N means that the map from UN lambda can't factor through this quotient. So in other words, it ha there has to be a non-zero map from some V lambda. If you restrict to this subgroup, you know, some V lambda has to map, has to have a non-zero map. Has to, you know, the map from some V lambda has to be non-zero into you. Okay, so then if N is greater than one, then you get a non-zero map from V lambda. And if N is one, then you have a non-zero map from U1 lambda. Okay, so you get a non-zero map from one of these groups. Okay, and now we need to show that, that map is actually an inclusion. So here's a lemma. Any quotient of V lambda or U1 lambda by a non-zero subgroup is isomorphic to a, a K subgroup is isomorphic to a power of GA. Okay, so these things don't really uh, admit much in the way of quotients. Uh, okay, so the woundness of U then implies that the map must be an inclusion. Because if it weren't an inclusion, then you'd get a map from GA. Um, so, okay, great. We've shown it contains one of these two groups. And now we have to show that the quotient is wound. Um, so, and, and by the way, what I'm saying here is actually stronger than what the results. Of the, so the, the proposition says there exists a sequence. I'm actually saying for any map from V lambda, U1 lambda, the map is an inclusion and the quotient is wound. So you have a lot of options in some sense. Um, so the fact that the quotient is wound uses crucially the fact that you're in degree of imperfection one. So uh, in general, if you form a quotient by say V, a v group V lambda, then uh, over a field of higher degree of imperfection, the quotient need not be wound. So here's an example. Suppose lambda and mu are P independent elements of K, so which exist if K is degree of imperfection greater than one. And you define the group W by this equation. So sum of lambda to the I X out of the P equals mu T to the P plus T. T is another variable inside GA to the P plus one. So this group, the fact that these two elements are P independent implies that this group is wound unipotent. Um, and it lives in an exact sequence like this, where the map to GA is the map which is the projection onto T, right? So that's a surjection and the kernel is T equals zero. That is precisely the equation for V lambda when you set the right side equal to zero. So you have this exact sequence. Um, so you have a wound group with a V lambda inside, but a non-wound quotient. So you need to use the fact that K is degree of imperfection one. Okay, so now returning to the proof, um, let U prime inside U be isomorphic to either V lambda or U one lambda. And suppose for the sake of contradiction that U mod this thing, mod this U prime is not wound, which you know precisely says that U contains a subgroup W which lives in an exact sequence like this. So it's an extension of GA by U prime, right? You take the pre-image of, of a GA inside this quotient and you get your W. So because U is wound, so is the subgroup W. And so now we have a lemma which completes the proof. So over a field of degree of imperfection one, any extension of GA by U prime, which is commutative and P torsion uh, necessarily contains a copy of GA. So you can't have an extension like this inside a wound group because it'll contain a GA, okay? So yeah, so the, the Devisage proposition reduces now to this statement that an extension of GA by one of these two groups necessarily contains a GA. So let me sketch the proof of this result, uh, sort of maybe somewhat briefly. Um, so we have a commutative exact diagram. So we have this U prime with inside W with GA quotient. Now you, let's take the case, for example, when U prime is V lambda, U1 lambda is similar. So let's take it to V lambda. Then it sits in, by definition, it's given by some equation in GA to the P, right? It's the sum of lambda. Right, sorry, which P. one was V lambda again? What's the notation? Which one was which? Uh, here, it's the, non-smooth oh. group. So it's oh. given by this equation. Okay. So it's by definition, it sits inside GA to the P. 
uh, and there's some, you know, so you have this map is the, you know, xi goes to some lambda to the i, to the i xi to the p, and the kernel is this u prime. Uh, so you form this pushout diagram by this inclusion, and you get some group w1. And the point is, because this is commutative p torsion, w1 is also commutative p torsion. And now we have this lemma, which is that a commutative p torsion extension of ga by ga to the p necessarily splits. And the, the p is actually not really relevant here, but whatever. So this extension splits. And the fact that it splits means, so this is some ga to the p plus one. And in fact, the fact that it splits says that w is given by an equation of the form uh, f of t equals some lambda to the i xi to the p. So the equation for u prime equals f of t. Your f of t is basically this, the map from ga to, to here, to w1, to this ga to the p. It's the splitting. So w is given by an equation like this. Uh, and we want to show that such a thing contains a copy of ga. Um, and, you know, f of t here is some p polynomial. So it's some, some ci t to the p to the i. Now we use the fact that k has degree of imperfection one. So because k is degree of imperfection one, your any p polynomial f has the property that if you subtract a combination of you know sum of lambda ti gi to the p for some polynomials gi, this is uh, either zero or it's homogeneous linear. If you choose suitable gi's, right? But basically, because each individual coefficient can be written as a sum of lambda ti times a p power, because k is degree of imperfection one. And so if we make the substitution x goes to xi, xi goes to xi plus gi of t, then the gi of t's will cancel from both sides, so to speak, and we'll get um, that the group w is actually given by an equation, sum lambda to the i xi to the p equals h of t, where h is, you know, it's either zero or homogeneous linear. So it's either zero or ct for some c and k cross. And in either of these two cases, w contains a copy of ga. So for example, if uh, it's ct for some non-zero c, then the map, the projection to the xi factors, that map to ga to the p will be an isomorphism, right? You can solve for t, if t is one over c times this thing. Uh, and if h is zero, then what you get is zero is this sum. So your group then is just v lambda times ga, uh, it's, it splits. And so in that case, you also contain a copy of ga. All right, so that is the proof of the Debussage proposition. And so that sort of is roughly how you prove rigidity uh, in degree of imper degree of imperfection one. So now I want to spend the remainder of the talk talking about higher degree of imperfection. Um, what you know, encounter examples and and how to um, how to salvage this problem, these how to salvage the results. So okay, so some of these things, so rigidity and the some of its corollaries fail in degree of imperfection greater than one. Okay, so now here are some examples. Like be a field of degree of imperfection greater than one, and so by definition that means that you have two p independent elements. That's what it means to have degree of imperfection greater than one. So it turns out that the unirational groups u1 lambda and u1 mu, which are defined as these ve restriction of gm from k adjoint lambda to the one over p mod gm, are given by the following equations. So you can write them down explicitly as, you know, u1 lambda is the sum from i0 to p minus one of lambda i xi to p equals x p minus one. That's uh, an equation for u1 lambda and u1 mu similarly, but replace lambda with mu, okay? Now consider the unipotent group u sub lambda mu defined by the following equation. So take the sum from, so for, over all i and j between zero and p, inclusive on the left, not on the right, of lambda to the i mu to the j, z i j to the p is z p minus one, p minus one inside g a p squared. So the z i j's are, are sort of your variables and they're p square of them. Okay, so this is a p square minus one dimensional uh, group. And in fact, it's a wound unipotent group because lambda and mu are p independent. This, this group is wound. Nevertheless, uh, even though we have these unirational, so, well, okay, we have a non-trivial bi-additive map from u1 lambda times u1 mu to u lambda mu defined by the formula sending, you know, if you have xi in here and yj in here, then you send them to zij is xi yj. And that's, a, well, that's a bi-additive map. Why does it land in u lambda mu? Well, because uh, basically because the left side here is the product of these left sides and the right side is the product of these right sides. So if you're in, if you know you have x i satisfying this and y j satisfying this, then the product of these two will be the product of these two, which is to say this will equal this. Okay, so this is a bi-additive map, non-trivial bi-additive map from this group times this this unirational times this unirational group to this uh, group. And since a non-trivial bi-additive map is never a homomorphism, 
This gives a counterexample to rigidity. Here's a unirational group. Here's a group not containing a copy of GA. And yet you have a K-scheme morphism, which sends identity to identity, which is not a homomorphism, right? Namely, this biadditive map. OK. Uh, and I should also say, by the way, that the image of this biadditive map actually generates u lambda mu as a group. So this is actually also a unirational group. All right. And so that shows rigidity fails. And now we'll construct counterexamples to some of the corollaries. So here's an example of a non-commutative wound unirational group. Um, so consider the group u prime, which is u1 lambda times u1 mu. So you, these two groups, you just take their product. And now we define a non-trivial non-symmetric biadditive map from u prime times u prime to u lambda mu by the formula u of u v. So u uh, is in u prime and v is in uh, u prime and so on and so forth. Or sorry, sorry, sorry. u is in u1 lambda and v is in u1 mu and u prime is in u1 lambda and v prime is in u1 mu. Then the product, then you send this product to the pairing between u and v prime. So you just forget these two factors. You just pair this element of u1 lambda with this element of u1 mu via this biadditive map, which is non-trivial. Okay, so this defines a non-trivial symmetric biadditive map from u prime times u prime to u lambda mu. Not non-symmetric, right? Non-symmetric, yes, very important that it's not symmetric, right? Because it, it's not, because if you switch them, then you pair this with this, right? And so this paired with this is not gonna be the same as this paired with this in general. So it's not symmetric, okay. Uh, now we define the group W as follows. Uh, as a case scheme, W will be U lambda mu times U prime. But the group structure is given by this weird twisted formula. So given an element of U lambda mu and U prime and something in U prime, and this is in U lambda mu and this is in U prime. So what's their product? Their product is, so on the U prime factor, it's just usual addition on U prime. But on the U lambda mu factor, you add these two elements, u1 and u2, but then you also add the pairing between these two elements under- Sorry, Zev, Zev, sorry. What was, yeah. can you remind what was u, there's a lot of notation. Can you remind yeah, what, yeah, was, what was u prime again? It's u1 lambda times u1. Oh, okay. okay. And there's a pairing. So on some level, you don't even really have to know what it is. That, that's part of why I said there's this, all you really need to know are these properties. So these are all unirational groups and you have a non-trivial, non-symmetric biadditive map from u prime times u prime to u lambda mu. That's all you need to know, actually. You don't need to even know what it is. Um, and so now you have this formula, which is u1 plus mu2 plus this pairing on u prime. So you pair these two elements u prime, you get something in u lambda mu. And this is your, this is your group law. So the biadditivity of H, just formally, you don't even have to know what H is. The biadditivity implies that it's a group law. And the fact that H is not symmetric, again, without even knowing what H is, implies it's a non-commutative group law. So this is a non-commutative group law on this unirational scheme. And in fact, it, it's a wound unipotent group because it's an, in fact, this, the, the projection map to U prime is a homomorphism with kernel isomorphic to U lambda mu. Okay, so this gives you an example, a non-commutative wound unirational group. And it also gives an example of a wound unirational group with two distinct group structures with the same identity. Namely, you have the obvious one, the product structure. And then you have this weird twisted structure, which also has the identity, you know, it's the point zero, zero is the identity of this. So you have two different group structures. So the point is all the correlators of rigidity, well, not all, not the descent of unirationality through separable extensions, but the, you know, commutativity, the uniqueness of group structures and the rigidity statement itself all fail for fields of higher degree of imperfection. Okay, so how do you uh, remedy the situation? Um, so I'll briefly discuss work in progress, which yields rigidity results for arbitrary fields of higher degree of imperfection. Okay, so here is one of the main results, um, or at least a this is actually a special case of one of the main results. So let K be a field and U a wound unipotent K group and yet lambda is just some element of K. Then there are no non-zero K morphisms from P, so you take P1 and you, uh, you know, remove this closed point given by lambda to the one over P to the N. So this purely inseparable closed point so there are no maps from this scheme times itself to you, no K scheme maps, such that if either uh, coordinate is, the, is infinity, then the map, then uh, the image, then it vanishes, right? So F vanishes when restricted to infinity times one factor and it vanishes when restricted to the other factor times infinity. Okay, so if you have a map from this times this to you, just that vanishes when either factor is infinity, then in fact, it's the zero map. So are we assuming something about like zero comma zero goes to the identity or something? 
Well, we assume that infinity times anything goes to the identity and that anything times oh. infinity. Okay. Yeah. So it vanishes when the infinity is also not really relevant. It doesn't matter. It could be any K point. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it could be, here's a K point and here's another K point. I mean, but um, I, I, this is just a special case that I, you know, and then more generally you have a similar jitter result for maps P1 minus a closed point times P1 minus some other closed point provided, this is very important, that the extension K joint X, Y of K is primitively generated. So it's generated by a single element. So the issue really here with this counter example was that basically this is constructed from roughly speaking, the complement of lambda to the one over P. And this is from the complement of mu to the one over P. And if you take the extension K adjoint uh, lambda to the one over P mu to the one over P, that's not a primitively generated extension. That requires two, that's the sort of famous example, right? Of a non-primitively generated extension. Right, so you know, separable extensions, finite separable, are always primitively generated. But for inseparable extensions, they can require uh, more generators. Uh, and in fact, so the above result here is actually a special case of a more general rigidity, res rigidity result, uh, which deals with. Okay, in order to state it precisely, you need to give some definitions, and really, one should one has to verify that they're well defined. But basically, the idea somehow is something like. You take a bunch of open subschemes of P1, let's say X1 up to Xn, and you have a map from X1 times X2 times blah 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 times Xn to you, and it's restriction to you know, let's say let's say infinity, but you could pick any rational point infinity. If any of the coordinates is infinity, let's say it's zero. Okay, and then we consider the complement of Xi. So here the complement is lambda to the one over P to the n. Here it would be X, and here it would be Y. The complement is some divisor, and if you know. It's uh, if you take the if you take all of its points, you get a bunch of field field extensions of k, and what you can do is embed them all into some single extension, right, at the same time, and that extension. So like here, you get k join x y, let's say, uh, and that extension, the minimum number of generators, let's say the minimum number of generators is three, then in fact, what you get is that if n is bigger than three, if there are more than three factors, then the map vanishes. Uh, and more generally, if, you know, if the number of uh, if the number of generators is R, then if there are more than R factors, the map vanishes. Uh, this is why things work well in degree of imperfection one. If K is a field of degree of imperfection one, then any finite extension is primitively generated. So, in other words, if there's more than one factor, the map is zero. Uh, could you explain why you? call this rigidity? Maybe it's obvious, but I'm not seeing it. Uh, well, I call it rigidity just because it says that, well, it's analogous to the abelian variety rigidity statement. Roughly speaking, it says that there are, if your restriction to this point is zero and to this point, you know, this point times whatever is zero and this times this thing is zero, then the map must be zero. It says that there are very few maps. There's a rigid set of maps, so to speak. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, it's like the rigidity, you know, for abelian varieties, there's some statement that like if one factor, right, the rigidity theorem for abelian varieties falls from some rigidity lemma about, you know, if x times y to z with x proper, then if one single fiber is constant, then the whole map only depends on the second factor, right? So it's some statement about there are a few maps, and this is something similar where, you know, if this these restrictions are zero, then the whole map is zero. But so it's analogous to that lemma, right? But rigidity is about um, morphisms between abelian varieties. Yes, and, and, this and has, here you have kind of different things. No, that's true. Um, yeah, so I, you're right. I'm using rigidity sort of loosely, but this also has applications. I mean, basically, the way I think about the abelian varieties is there's a rigidity lemma, and then there's which is just some statement about maps of schemes when one of them is proper, and then there are the applications to abelian varieties, right? Uh, Similarly here, let's say in degree of imperfection one, for example, this sort of rigidity result gives you that a map is always a homomorphism, right? That a map of more of schemes is in fact a homomorphism. Uh, and it will have similar, it'll have other implications um, over general fields, but you're right. I mean, I'm using it sort of loosely, sure. Uh, okay, but so this result already has interesting uh, applications. So let me discuss some of them. Uh, yes, I still have 10 minutes. So uh, over fields of degree of imperfection greater than one, uh, we saw that a unirational wound unipotent group uh, may be non-commutative, right? We have some examples. Uh, nevertheless, they're always generated by commutative unirational subgroups. Okay, so if U is a unirational wound unipotent K-group scheme, then it's generated by its commutative unirational K-subgroups. Uh, K subgroups. 
Uh, and, and I should say, this is something that's totally false for arbitrary, let's say, wound unipotent groups. Um, you can construct two-dimensional ones, which are not commutative. And in particular, it follows that they're not generated by their commutative subgroups, um, by their smooth connected commutative subgroups. OK, so what's the idea of the proof here? So um, the unirational group U is generated by k-morphisms from open subschemes of P1, right? That's because it's unirational, uh, that pass through the identity of U. So beginning with such a morphism from X to U, X is an open subscheme of P1. So we have a partial fraction decomposition for the map F. So this is just a phrase. I mean, it's sort of analogous in a sense, which one can make precise to sort of the classical partial fraction decomposition. Uh, and we can write it thereby as a product of maps of the form P1 minus X to U for X a closed point of P1. So X is now a single closed point. So now your big X, instead of just being an arbitrary open subscheme, it's one whose complement is a single closed point. So now I claim that any such map into a unipotent, a wound unipotent group generates a commutative subgroup of U. Okay, and so in particular, U is generated by such maps and therefore it's generated by commutative subgroups, uh, commutative unirational subgroups. And in fact, the reason is that thanks to the rigidity theorem for self maps, oh, this is bad. I, okay, I, I meant to write P1 minus X here. For maps from P1 minus X plus P1 minus X to U, the, we find that the commutator map to U must be trivial by rigidity because it's restriction. Like if, if you take a point here that maps to the identity of U, let's say it's the point infinity, it doesn't matter, then you get the zero map. And similarly, if this one is maps to the identity, you get the zero map. So we follows from this result that the whole map is the, is the trivial map. So we find that um, mm -hmm. this uh, commutator map is trivial. So the group generated by it is commuted. OK, and now uh, we can also prove that over arbitrary fields, rather than just degree of imperfection one, that unirationality, unirationality descends through separable extensions. Okay, So the key case is when the group is wound unipotent. Um, right. So let's suppose that uh, it's unirational over a finite Galois extension. That's also, I mean, the theorem is for arbitrary separable extensions, but the, the real case that matters is when it's finite Galois. You easily reduce to that by some spreading out and specializing argument. So. The idea of the proof in this case is you begin with a map from X prime to U over K prime, where X prime is an open subscheme of P1 over K prime. And again, we have a partial fraction decomposition, which allows us to assume that X prime is the complement of a closed point of P1 in K prime. Uh, so we get that U K prime is generated by groups of the, by maps from groups of this form. X prime is the complement of a single closed point of P1 K prime. Uh, then we consider the subgroup generated by X prime and its Galois conjugates. Okay, generated by this map and its Galois conjugates, right? So that's a K subgroup of U and the rigidity theorem applied to the commutator maps from X prime and its conjugates implies that this map, that this group is actually commutative. Again, uh, basically the point is if you take any element in some extension field, so remember there was this result about a map, uh, this map, you know, you have the same rigidity result if, you know, X doesn't have to equal Y, but they, we just need the extension to be primitive. Well, if X is any extent element in an extension field of K, finite extension, and you take a Galois conjugate of X, then the field they generate is still primitive over K, turns out. So you can apply this to X prime and its conjugates to conclude that uh, the commutator map must be the trivial map. And so we deduce that the, the group generated by X prime and its conjugates is a commutative K subgroup of U. And by construction, it's unirational over K prime because it's generated by the over K prime by these maps from X prime and its conjugates. So we have now U is generated by commutative K subgroups, which are unirational over the finite extension, K, finite Galois extension K prime. Well, by the theorem of Aket mentioned earlier, for commutative groups, unirationality descends through separable extensions. So it follows that U is generated by unirational K subgroups, right? These, these commutative groups are actually unirational over little k and is therefore also itself unirational over little k. So that's roughly how this rigidity result gets you this descent of unirationality through separable extensions. Uh, and I guess that's all I have to say. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So you mentioned earlier there was mm -hmm. Wait, what, so what was the result in progress that? 
Oh, uh, oh this is all work in progress. I mean, I mean, basically, oh, okay. I mean, the truth. There's actually a more general result, and and I, I know how to prove it, but um, I'm sort of uh, I have to write everything down carefully, and you know, just to make sure it's actually it all works out. There, there's yeah. I mean, it's this more general result, really. I see. Yeah. So is the more anything? general result involves more than two copies. Yes, it's when the, yeah. So in general, you have more than two copies, and the assumption is so the assumptions are you basically look at the complementary divisor so you'd say each one has some complementary divisor each copy in p1 you take the union of those divisors that's some divisor in p1 and uh you basically associate to that you can't associate a field to that but you can associate a number which is you take any of the fields so if i have like some a collection of fields right a divisor basically is a collection of field extensions of k finite field extensions of k um well, it's a little more precise. It's a, it's a collection of finite primitively generated extensions really. But if I have a bunch of such extensions, I can embed them all in some common extension of K, right? I just choose a big can algebraic closure of K and embed them all in there in some way, right? And then I can form their compositum of all those embedded fields. And if that compositum is generated by R elements, and it turns out that that actually, the question of how many elements you need is totally independent of the choices of embeddings, then, uh, the point is the map, if there are more than R factors, must be zero. So in the case of a primitively generated extension, you get if there's more than one factor. So if there's, let's say, two factors, the map is zero. Uh, yeah, so that's the general rigidity statement. And it implies, for example, here's a result that follows from that. Um, if you, let's say K is a field of degree of imperfection R, okay? For a field of degree of imperfection R with R bigger than zero, any finitely generated extension is generated by at most R elements. And so, in particular, you get that if you have more than R factors, then the map is um, the map is trivial. Okay, so if you're over a field degree of infection R, you can take a sort of multiple commutator map and deduce that the Rth central subgroup, any wound unirational K group, is trivial. So it gives you a bound on the sort of what's it called, the central class of nilpotence or something, nilpotency class. Yeah. Like for example, if K is a field degree of imperfection two, so it's like FP adjoint XY, any wound unirational group over that, over that U over that field has the property that its second central subgroup D two U is trivial. Degree of imperfection one, you get the first central subgroup D one U is just the derived group is trivial. That says U is commutative. But in general, you get that the Rth uh, derived, the Rth central subgroup is trivial. Does the dimension of U play any role here? Uh, no. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Does, does any of this connect back? Uh, does it like allow you to make any kind of reduction or anything with the original question of Sarah and Osterle at all? Oh, okay. So that's a, so I, I just sort of threw that out there as a motivation. And then, so basically, okay, let me return to the question. Mm, where is it? Ah, here. Yeah. So you have a global function field, a unipotent group, and it, is implementing rational points must contain non trivial and rational subgroup. And you could even throw away the unipotence assumption. Let's just say it's a uh, whatever, an affine group scheme or whatever. Okay, an affine group scheme of finite type. So um, I actually, I know how to prove this result, but I want to do everything in maximal general. <laughs> I'm sort of obsessive and I want to do everything in maximal generality. So really I could have just done the poor man's thing and just prove this result in degree of imperfection one, but uh, I want to prove a, much, a more general result than this anyway, and I'm, I'm sort of obsessive and, and uh, it's sort of- I'm sorry, are you saying that you, you know how to settle this question? Yeah, I haven't, uh, I, I, I want to be a little hesitant there because I haven't actually written out the proof, but I, I think I basically know how to do it. I just haven't oh. written out. Okay. But, but um, yeah, so, and yes, this is important in the argument. The, the fact that, I mean, in particular, my motivation for all of this was this proposition that you can descend unirationality through separable extensions. This is uh, important, important fact in the argument. Um, and and uh, there, yeah, so in fact, the result that should be true, uh, maybe I'll just say it here. Um, okay, I think actually an even more general result should be true over sort of higher field, degree of imperfection field, but, but let's just say global function fields. So if K is, a, just to be safe, so if K is a global function field, uh, then I think it should be true that if G of K, so G now is a, an affine group scheme, connected affine group scheme, if it, let's just say connected linear algebraic group, okay? If G of K is a risky dense in G, then G is unirational. 
So of course the reverse holds, but uh, the sort of non-obvious point is if, is that the only way it happens? And so the answer, and that easily implies the affirmative answer to this, because you just say, take the Zariski closure of the set of rational points and form its identity component. And that's a group, if you have infinitely many, that's a positive dimensional group, which has a risky dense set of rational points, it's connected. And so therefore it's, it's, you get, that's how you get your unirational group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, the point, the answer to your question is yes. The, you, this is a, this is connected to this. Yeah, I didn't just say this for no reason. <laughs> yeah, I should have specified. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess you could ask. I mean, so case of degree, degree of imperfection more than one. Uh, can one say anything about classifying, say, round, unirational, you know? commutative uh, group schemes, like for example, uh, if they have the, the smallest possible dimension, like P minus one, mm -hmm. you know, then can you classify them? Is that reasonable? Uh, well, if they have dimension P minus one, then uh, they're, yes, I mean, then they, well, okay. Over, then they are K forms, right? Because you can have, so you have these groups U1 lambda, right? Where, where are they? U1 lambda, here, U1 lambda. Uh, I think that it has to be a K form, a KS over K form of that group. So, you you know, let's say K is separably closed. It has to be one of these groups for some lambda and non pth power. And, and the reason is you get them because it's, you get a map from one of, from a, well, I should be a little careful actually. Uh, no, okay. You get a map from one of these groups, uh, whatever it is, UN lambdas, right? Or you have to be a little careful if it's P2, but, but yeah, you get a map from one of these UN lambdas and okay. So you have a map, let's say, from either V lambda or U1 lambda by this argument, wherever it is. I don't know where it was. Somewhere. This argument for the Debussy proposition. You get a map from V V1 lambda or U1 lambda for some lambda, a non-p power. And then it's well, the map has to be an inclusion by a non-zero map, and the map has to be an inclusion by this lemma. And so by dimension considerations, it can't be V lambda because the group is smooth, and so it has to be from U1 lambda uh, by dimension considerations. Right? The map is surjective, and so. It has to be, it's a KS over K form of one of the groups you want lambda. Yeah. If you have a P minus one dimensional wound unipotent K group scheme, then it is a KS over K form of U1 lambda for some lambda uh, in, let's say, uh, KS that's not a pth power. Can you describe what the automorphisms are? Okay, rather. Oh, yeah, of, well, of which group? For the U1 lambda, I mean, if you want to, like, say, you know, for U1 form. lambda, all the endomorphisms are FP. Right, you have, I mean, in fact, the, the argument is sort of similar to the thing I omitted when I discussed this, but um, yeah, the automorphisms are all just FP, right? Multiplication by a, some element of FP. Those are so all and you can even maybe, I mean, just in line with Bird's question, could you even be more precise then saying, and the forms are the following groups? Uh, well, I guess it depends what you mean by, right? What do you mean by R? I mean, of course you could always say, so, okay, so if the end automorphisms are FP cross, right? So therefore the forms are given by H1 of K FP cross, right? And so then you're like, well, I have a co-cycle. I can just write down a Galois descent datum from it. I mean, but do you consider that to be a, a, a no. an explicit? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, probably you could, but I don't know off the top of my head. No. Any other questions? Actually, sorry, let me just to say one more thing, sorry. With regard to, I guess you have to verify whether they really are when they're the same, but uh, it should be, no, it is true that any group that, well, I should be, in certainly in degree of imperfection, one, it's true, but I think it's probably just true in general, but, but let me just hedge my bets there. Uh, any form of U1 lambda is given by an equation like uh, this, where instead of XP minus one, you have some linear form in the XIs, non-zero linear form. Mm. So those are all of them. And then I guess you would have to say, well, when are they the same? Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>